Um, good morning. I'm Alexandra Whitmire, Sondra Whitmire. Hey, Ali. I know a lot of you guys. So it's good to see some familiar faces. Um, hopefully this won't be too uh, redundant for those of you that we've talked through HRP and you've seen some of this material before. Um, but I'm here to talk today about our behavioral health and performance uh, element in the NASA Human Research Program. I'm here on behalf of our element scientist, um, Dr. Lauren Levitin. She is at a conference in Berlin this week. Um, so hopefully this, uh, I won't get too nervous or fried like I already am, so my apologies. Um, okay, so today what I was going to talk about is just give you a little bit of background information on our element um, and then talk about some of what's considered space normal data uh, relative to behavioral health and performance. So we've had a few research studies that have completed on the ISS, uh, a couple of research studies, and so I'll talk to you a little bit about that today, some of the results um, from those. And then we'll look at some of the evidence coming out of ground-based analogs and uh, how this work informs our future work as we prepare for um, supporting crews, um, their, their uh, psychological health and, and well-being and performance um, in future exploration missions. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background on our elements, um, our goal is to identify, characterize, um, and prevent and mitigate behavioral health and performance risks associated with uh, exploration and, and also um, in current operations as well uh, when applicable. And so we focus our efforts on um, our model of predicting, preventing, monitoring, and treating risks. Um, and the way we do that is by developing tools and technologies um, to uh, treat those risks and um, also informing um, our health, human health and performance standards. So we'll talk about this a little bit more specifically in just a moment. Um, this is our path to risk reduction. Um, again, more template material here in the upfront. Uh, but essentially, the way that risks are defined in the Human Research Program is we look at um, the evidence that um, is happening out in the field. Um, so if there's new evidence um, terrestrially that we need to be concerned about, and then we couple that also with um, operations, what's going on in operations. Um, we've been tasked with three risks uh, that we call shorthand um, sleep, be met, and team. Within each of those risks, we've identified about 25 gaps. Um, these are gaps in knowledge or mitigation for us to get from where we are now um, to ready for a Mars mission. Then for each gap, there's a strategic path of research tasks. Um, these usually comprise of lab studies, analog studies, and some spaceflight studies. And then um, those tasks lead us to our deliverables, and these are um, whether it's evidence that helps us characterize these risks more fully, actual monitoring technologies, which we'll, we'll talk about, countermeasures, uh, requirements or standards. And then a lot of our efforts in the element um, goes into transitioning these products into operations. Um, where applicable, so where it might apply to ISS, we might be working now with crews, or it might be something that's just uh, there and ready for more of an exploration uh, scenario. So, um, as I mentioned to you, we have three risks, the BMED team and sleep risk. Um, and essentially we have kind of placed team in the middle here um, sort of purposefully um, because team, how you get along with people uh, can be a buffering or a mediating effect for um, how maybe if you're having anxiety issues or things along sort of that BMED arena, um, your team can really help mitigate some of these issues. Um, and so team is sort of placed um, in the middle there for a reason. Um, and then we have our sleep risk, uh, which is really more of a, we call it sleep risk, but it really more or less encompasses fatigue. So these are the three areas where we're doing research and, and technology development and trying to understand what do we have to have in place for these future crews who are gonna go to Mars along these, these three areas. Um, and some challenges for exploration class missions. Uh, for the BMED area, we really are lacking evidence to quantify and characterize the risk and uh, ways to detect risk early um, and individualize countermeasures. For teams, um, there's a lot of literature looking at team performance, um, not in spaceflight per se, but um, just in the general field, like in organizational psychology and other areas. But um, there's a lack of research looking at um, teams over time. And so when we were talking about going on a Mars mission, 
Um, we don't really know what the risks are that uh, teams are going to face. So this is an area where we're focusing our research. And then, as we'll take a look at in just a moment, um, there's evidence that suggests that sleep is reduced in microgravity, but the specific reasons as to why are unknown. And so that's a, a focus, as well as countermeasures. How can we help um, crews um, on their way to Mars really uh, maintain their circadian rhythms and uh, get optimal sleep? Um, and this has relevance also for the work that we're doing uh, with ISS, since uh, sleep appears to be an issue there. And we'll talk about that again more specifically in just a moment. And, and as you can see, these are all very interrelated. So um, currently on ISS, you know, there is a, uh, we have fantastic crew members um, who thrive overall during the course of their missions. Um, they are supported very heavily um, by uh, a fantastic team on the ground. There are folks in behavioral health and performance who work on the operations side, um, and they work with um, the families of the crew members. They support the crew members during their missions. Um, they really, the crew members have uh, re often reported uh, just how beneficial, how much they enjoy taking pictures of Earth, and so that's a, that's a real uh, nice countermeasure, you could say, for them um, during their six-month stays and soon-to-be one-year stays. Um, they uh, have opportunities to eat together. There's things like growing plants, um, and they enjoy a close communication with the ground with their families. They have uh, iPads now and uh, voice over IP phones and things like that that keep them um, closely connected. And the folks on the BHP Ops side just do a terrific job of caring for our ISS crews during this time. But as we shift from low Earth orbit, um, we're going to hit uh, risks like that we've not experienced before. So, as I just mentioned, you know, we have real-time communication with ground operations, with family and friends, the crew care packages that uh, the B BHP ops teams prepares, um, and these go up uh, for the crews during the course of their missions. They have discretionary events, so they get to um, have like a, uh, a meeting with um, somebody on the ground, I think like Clay Anderson, I had a a time where he talked with a, a, his home football team. Um, there's uh, the photography that goes on. Um, they're able to exercise, whether that's the two hours a day is a stressor or a countermeasure, I guess, is uh, up to each individual. And, and they have high, you know, high tempo workload. So not at all to minimize what they go through, but the, the um, closeness to home does facilitate for a good support system from the ground. Um, and the ISS is relatively large compared to some of these future vehicles. Um, they have private crew quarters, and the missions to date have been, have been around six months. Now, when we start shifting over to deep space focus, we're talking now about missions that might last uh, a, a mission to Mars. Right now, the, the design reference mission is looking at a two and a half year um, duration, so unprecedented uh, duration and distance. We have loss, uh, times of total loss of communication, or at least <coughs> delays in communication, that distance and delay in communication is going to force more autonomous operations than what the crews have now. Um, no <coughs> resupply or options for evacuations from what we can tell. Um, limited volume and confinement, um, com certainly compared to what they have now. And then radiation exposure threats. Uh, and so we know that these are real risks that the future crews are going to be facing. And so it really has us thinking, how are we going to select and compose the right crews? How are we going to maintain uh, meaningful work and motivation on these kinds of missions? Enhance the growth and resiliency of the crews. Um, ensure that despite the distance, despite the calm delays, they stay connected to home. Um, how, will they, how will they manage uh, stress and mood and morale? Um, how are we going to provide recommendations for the right sized vehicle? and uh, provide a, a sensory-rich environment um, in these kinds of uh, capsules that we're talking about sending. And how are they going to manage things like sleep, fatigue, and workload, and uh, Earth out of view. So we really are having to shift uh, how we think about uh, mission support and when we look at Mars. And so the key outcomes of interest that we're looking at in our research, um, these span aspects of behavioral health, um, psychosocial adaptation, teamwork, uh, cognitive performance, and so you can see some sp more specific examples there. These are the kinds of things that we try to measure and we figure out what's, what's the way to measure, the validated way to measure these things um, in the spaceflight environment or an analog environment. So uh, when we're out doing research, we can really determine um, whether these stressors are having um, 
a real effect over time and whether the countermeasures that we are introducing um, improve our uh, crew health um, adaptation, um, teamwork, and, and cognitive performance. And so just to walk you now through a little bit through the data that we do have, there's not a whole lot. Um, our, we've concluded, like I mentioned earlier, just a couple of studies. There's a third study that is um, completed the data collection phase, but we don't have the data analysis, uh, or that team doesn't have the data analysis yet. So um, we have identified that there's behavioral errors susceptible to increased risk over a one-year mission. We, we've talked about these and over an exploration mission. Um, we don't have temporal trend data for all of these measures. We don't know how some of these um, outcomes might uh, fluctuate over time or evolve over time. And uh, so we're hoping to evaluate these um, in analogs and also in the one year, upcoming one year missions to help inform our, our risk posture for exploration. Um, but what we do know of ISS uh, and what we've been able to see from the data that we do have, the limited data that we do have, is that um, things aren't static. So sleep isn't static, stress isn't static. Um, I had some preliminary data in here that I had to pull from that third study that I mentioned. Um, but that, that preliminary analysis from that third study does seem to show that there's a, a dynamic uh, 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 evolution with, with stress in mission and that it's very individual too. Some crew members um, really don't experience stress or improve while others um, tend to report increased stress over time. Um, and so it's very individualized and very dynamic. And uh, sleep is something we do have a little bit more data on. and. Um, we do see that uh, it doesn't improve, so we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, overall, it doesn't tend to improve, and that there are correlations between sleep, stress, tiredness, and physical exhaustion that suggest um, there might be something physiologically going on. So this is where we want to focus sort of our forward work. Um, but in looking at what we do know from space flight, so uh, some of you might have heard in the press, um, I believe our, re our researcher, uh, Dr. Laura Barger, was actually on Fox News back in August about this. Um, so there was a very recent publication. Uh, this study uh, from the uh, Dr. Seisler and Dr. Laura Barger team out at Harvard Medical School um, conducted as the largest systematic study of sleep on orbit. Um, they collected data on, I believe, an N of about 80 on shuttle, some were repeat flyers and then an N of about 21 on ISS. Um, and these crew members wore um, actigraphy devices on their wrist, and they also filled out sleep logs and over the duration of their mission. And so it provided an objective measure of sleep-wake activity in addition to some of their feedback uh, relative to sleep. And what we saw from both shuttle and ISS was that uh, sleep duration was uh, on average, average nightly sleep duration was about six hours. So we were expecting initially, that wasn't much of a surprise for shuttle, but I think a lot of folks were expecting an increase on ISS. Um, but overall, on average, sleep tends to be right around six hours. It's about five hours and 58 minutes for shuttle, and I think six hours and uh, 14 minutes on ISS. And uh, the research team that did this um, looked at estimates of circadian phase. So circadian rhythms, that's our biological clock, and uh, that tells us um, there's, there's certain physiological responses that happen when we're supposed to go to sleep, that kind of cue us to going to sleep, and when we wake up. And uh, using the data that they did have from the, the sleep-wake data, they were able to estimate uh, when crews were misaligned versus when they were aligned. And it appeared that on about 21% of the nights, the ISS crews were misaligned. Um, and so this meant that they were um, awake when they were supposed to be asleep. Um, and when misaligned, not surprisingly, their, their average uh, sleep reduced to about 4.77 hours. And medication use um, also increased. So that's pretty intuitive that if you're having to be awake when you're um, supposed to be asleep, that you're gonna um, struggle to fall asleep and so medication use might increase. But again, we saw um, no significant difference in um, shuttle and ISS and also uh, one compelling finding or one finding that got a lot of the press, the recent press, was that overall um, sleep, did not, sleep duration did not appear to improve uh, significantly when crew members took medications, sleep medications versus not taking sleep medications. So the question is why? Why do we see this 
this um, um, trend in flight, is there something in the microgravity environment that is leading them to not respond to sleep medications as effectively as they may on the ground? Um, so the, also the reduced sleep of a right around six hours. There were some <coughs> crew members that showed an improvement on weekends, just like all of us when we know we have to get up for work, we might have a presentation that keeps us up. There's um, things that come up, EVAs, uh, and we see a drop in their sleep. They average closer to four hours the night before EVAs. Um, and, uh, but there didn't appear to be an increasing trend, a, an adaptation that happened. So sleep consistently stayed uh, right around that, that average of six hours. So that is a concern, not just for our ISS crews now, but when we're thinking about, okay, in a Mars scenario, um, crews will be you know, confined, they'll be further from, from our, our teams here, they won't have the level of support from ground control that they do now, um, and so this poses a, you know, a, a real risk for exploration missions. Um, and we tie this amount of six hours of sleep to terrestrial data because a lot of uh, pushback that we get is, you know, I get six hours, a lot of people I know get six hours, I function okay, you know, people do fine. And there are, um, there is research that shows that there are some people who are more resilient to sleep loss. So it, it is a valid uh, uh, point to say that, you know, for some people, six hours is okay, they can function. But it's a, it appears to be a small uh, amount of the population that for most people, we really need closer to seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, and there's research that shows, um, th this is a study from Dr. David Dinges' lab, um, that seven consecutive nights at around six hours will lead to um, impairments um, that have been seen at uh, one total uh, night of total sleep loss. So here you see it at seven hours, um, uh, participants in the lab here fall into that impairment range, and that's equal to studies that have looked at um, a total night of sleep deprivation, so pulling an all-nighter. Um, on tasks that focus on vigilance and attention, um, people perform the same if they've pulled an all-nighter than if they've been up, or they've been getting about six hours of sleep consecutively. And, um, and in these studies, they've also asked people to, to indicate how they feel. Do they feel alert? Do they feel they can perform? And you'll see discrepancy, people indicating, yes, I feel okay, but then on these objective measures, um, they're making mistakes that are synonymous with what we see when people have been up all night. So we tend to be poor gauges of how much sleep is affecting us, um, even though there is that small percent of the population that truly is resilient. Um, we tend to be poor, poor gauges, and that's why objective measures are so valuable. So before doing a critical task, um, having a quick tool that can objectively assess your fatigue levels um, could be ideal and maybe something that's introduced into the operational environment. Um, this measure that uh, these studies have been done with, um, it is considered the gold standard for measuring fatigue-related performance effect, and uh, this is that study that I mentioned a couple times before, just concluding now um, on ISS, and so we'll be able to look at, um, in the context of ISS operations, what is the trend with PVT uh, performance there, but um, that's probably about another year out before those data are released. Um, now, we've taken this data before in different arenas at NASA, um, and it's you know, a valid question we get is, okay, this is a cognitive measure, what does that mean operationally? We see what you're saying here with this cognitive measure, but what are the actual error rates in flight? And we don't have uh, data related to error rates or actual work performance. But um, there was a recent NSBRI-funded uh, study over at MIT led by Dr. Omen where they looked at PVT performance and performance on the robotic arm. And they actually sent down a couple of students to JSC who got trained on the robotic arm and who developed a, a measure in their lab that's very similar to th the training that goes on here with the robotic arm. So it's a high fidelity sort of performance task. And they saw that performance on the PVT correlates to performance on that robotic arm. So hopefully that's making a bit more of a tie that um, the, this cognitive measure is um, has some operational significance to it. Okay, so um, a study that has, another spaceflight study that has concluded, and I highly recommend um, if you're interested in the behavioral side of things for spaceflight, Google uh, Stuster or Astronaut Journals, 
and you can find this full p PDF online, and it is just uh, fascinating. Um, Dr. Sester has worked with ISS Cruz. He, he completed um, his first study in 2010. Um, he had uh, an N of 10 astronauts on the ISS who journaled over the duration of their, of their stay. And then he conducted an analysis of their journals based on work he had previously done with crews in Antarctica. And uh, the analysis is based on a premise that Dr. Sester has developed a, a, a theory that um, the more salient something is, the more um, people will journal about it. Pretty simple premise, but you know, of course you could say, well, breathing is very important. We wouldn't journal about breathing. But um, these are really those, those factors that if they're most important um, to the crew member, that's probably what they're gonna spend the bulk of their time journaling on. And so that's what his analysis is based on. And so um, he and his team did a content analysis and what they found was that um, work is the topic that crew members journal the most about, not surprisingly. Um, and this followed by outside communications and then a category he uh, coined adjustment group interaction, reaction and leisure time, equipment, events, um, organization and management, sleep and food. And then he continues to do his analysis here. You can see logistics and storage and exercise and so forth are also topics that have been journaled by the crews. But he sort of drew a line after the top 10 because then the rest of his report digs deeper at these top 10 categories. And he does some analysis within each of those 10. And so he, he might look at um, the positive and negative frequencies of these aspects um, and, and also pulls in some quotes, some specific quotes on these topics. So if you're interested, I highly recommend um, take a look at this. The full report's available online um, for free. And so we were asked a while back to uh, try to pull data that we did have from six-month missions and identify what were the risks in going to the one-year missions. Um, and this was tricky, as you can imagine. I have given you sort of the spaceflight data that we have from ISS. Um, and, uh, but, but we worked with what we had. And um, in journals, um, and let me just catch this by saying overall, the cruise, you'll find an incredibly positive experience. And you know, that's no surprise. Our astronauts are top notch. Um, the experience is very positive, very rewarding. So um, it's, it's a... Um, it's a very, very positive and enriching environment uh, for them and experience for them. But within the analysis that Dr. Stutzer has done, you know, we looked and we could see some things that might pose a, current, a concern for the, for the one year. So uh, one of the things that this is uh, Dr. Vesey, uh, who's in our group, he looked at um, going back to that communications uh, topic. Um, Dr. Stutzer had done some assessments that showed that there might be an upward trend of conflicts by mission quarter, um, at least based on the analysis that we saw in this N of 10, and that also there was a decline in the group interaction positivity ratings by mission quarter. So uh, some, some indication that you know, these are the kinds of things that we'd wanna make sure to protect over the one-year mission, and then of course, you know, general, uh, thinking about exploration missions. And so these, again, this is some of the further analysis that Dr. Stutzer presents, um, and that while spaceflight experience is rated very positively um, and astronauts thrive in space, there are still things like stress, low morale, negative mood that occurs. I mean, just like all of us living here on Earth, we, we go through times, but um, on ISS, as you can see here, um, it looks like in that, and th this is uh, kind of clustered or ca colored by um, quarter, and so what you can see here is, it's difficult probably to see from where you're standing, but low morale is one of those things that we see in that third quarter. We saw an increase in, in the journal's data. And uh, adjustment, not surprisingly, in the beginning, sort of tapers down in those middle two quarters, a bit of an increase near the end. High morale, sort of higher at the beginning and at the end, and sort of dipping down in those, in those middle uh, uh, part of the, of the mission. So these kinds of things would suggest that there is a temporal, some temporal dynamic to um, uh, the missions. And uh, when we talk about going from six months to a year ISS mission, or going to a two and a half to three year Mars mission, you know, we want to keep these things in mind about some of the things that the crews uh, might experience during that time. So space flight data, uh, again, uh, limited in our area on ISS, but uh, still 
uh, enough for us to see some of our risks. But because we have so few space flight studies, uh, we are right now um, conducting studies in isolated, confined, and extreme environments. Um, and there's a large body of literature actually of Antarctica research that's happened, um, 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, you know, 90s and today. Um, but the difficulty is that a lot of these studies are done with um, inconsistent measures or they might be done in very large Antarctic bases. And so it's not always easy to generalize even from analog research into space flight. So we're implementing research uh, right now in areas such as Antarctica um, we'll talk a little bit about the Mars 500 study um, to try to uh, supplement you know, what we're missing from spaceflight. And really, as uh, great of an analog as the ISS is for future space missions, uh, from a behavioral perspective, um, when we think about what the ISS offers versus what a Mars mission will be like, um, it's different in a lot of ways. It's, uh, like we talked about before, that larger environment, the heavy support system. So this analog research helps us um, address some of the gaps that we have um, in research. But we have researchers that have looked at some of the risks that emerge in uh, the winter overs in Antarctica, and they see evidence of you know, social withdrawing, uh, depression, lack of concentration, short-term memory, and, and things like that. Um, there's also further reports of difficulty of disengaging from failed relationships, not surprisingly. You know, when people go away for a year in Antarctica, you know, they face uh, trying to reconcile how to deal with relationships they have back home or relationships they form with the folks there. Um, they tend to focus on microstimuli, so this is something that has us thinking, okay, for a mission to Mars. Um, and f a story here from uh, Dr. Christian Otto, who is the lead scientist on the, on the VIPRISC in the Human Research Program. He was with BHP several years ago, and he wintered over twice in Antarctica, and he shared a story about um, they had, in one of the stations he was at, they had one cook for the station. And um, what happened was, as this year went on, as the months went on in Antarctica, um, the cook heard more and more scrutiny around the food because people in that context had few things to really focus on. And so the food becomes all the more important in that setting. And so it, the scrutiny would increase and increase and increase. And so he finally quit. Um, and they had to put him in like the brig, which was essentially a room, I think from what Christian says, a room with a TV, and he just kind of had to wait out the rest of the mission. Um, but these kinds of things in that context of isolation, confinement, where you're in a very small um, environment with just a few people, uh, tend to take on um, real importance. I, mean, I think food's important now, but <laughs> can imagine in a context like that, it becomes you know really, really important. One of the few things that they had that was different uh, day in and day out. Um, and a lot of them reported also at things like insomnia. So um, one of the things that uh, one of our researchers found is that um, what helped people adapt more um, in this kind of setting was the tone of the station manager, if people had prior experience, and then if their uh, expectations were realistic. And so this informs us, okay, yeah, well, we're going and selecting or developing training curriculum for exploration. We need to make sure that we really hone in on how to help people's expectations and those kinds of things. Um, and then a lot of them reported some overall positive experiences. The, the work is very challenging. Um, they came to really appreciate their colleagues. They mastered new skills and just the self-satisfaction from um, enduring on such a mission. So we want to look at the uh, positive aspects and not just sort of this risk piece. Um, another analog where we've been able to uh, uh, conduct research or support research, actually this was funded through the National Space Biomedical Research Institute. Um, this is a 520-day uh, study um, that happened, or it was a, a chamber study where a crew of four um, spent over a year, and there's been a couple of publications from the U.S. team that uh, did research there. There's a publication from Dr. Basner, and they found that um, in this context, so uh, in this chamber that was, um, if this is not in a dangerous environment, so the, there's, a, there's a fidelity to space flight, and then there's a lack of fidelity to space flight. And so you're talking about uh, not a very dangerous environment, but um, one of the things, and, and I'm sorry, let me backtrack, also the workload tempo um, is, is rigorous but not uh, to the quantities or not to the tempo that we see in space flight. But what they did find was that overall the sleep increase over the duration of the mission 
um, but that four of the six crew members experienced um, one or more of the following problems. There was a crew member that had, was sleeping, tended to sleep at different times than everybody else. Um, and actually a couple of folks who did that. Um, and then there was one who uh, had re consistently had reduced sleep. Somebody else had reduced sleep and then had related performance deficits. Um, and then a couple of folks who reported that you, um, their sleep duration might not have been as reduced, but the quality of their sleep uh, was really lacking. So another finding from the study, because they wore the crew members in this um, mission, were actigraphy, and the researchers looked not only at their sleep, but also at their activity levels, and found that there was a decreasing trend over time in, um, in movement. So the crews became more and more sedentary over time in this context. Uh, which was another kind of concern that, that raised uh, for Mars crew. So it was good that they looked not just at the sleep, but their overall activity levels. Of course, when this made it out into the press about a year and a half ago, there were articles that titled like, Mars crew's lazy on the way to Mars. And you know, it, it, it's crazy how it gets misconstrued from the science to the press. But um, again, a very informative study ad addressing things that you know, very few uh, studies out there looking at missions of this duration of a 520 day. There's a second publication this year by the same team. Um, they looked more at behavioral outcomes and found that there were some reports of conflict um, and that those who tended to report conflict also, uh, that was associated with their amount of sleep that they re um, uh, had reported. All right, so shifting now, looking at Mars. Again, our exploration stressors um, that we've talked about. So what's the forward work that we're doing to address this new, these new risks? Um, I can't articulate very well this slide. This is results of a radiation study that's uh, being done by Bob Hines um, and Catherine Davis at Johns Hopkins. But essentially what they're um, seeing in rodents is that you know, there are um, neurocognitive effects, neurobehavioral effects that occur under uh, radiation exposure. And, um, but that there's a lot of individual differences. So some rats seem to have some level of resilience versus others. Um, and their team is also looking at uh, countermeasures for radiation and they have found some protection uh, related to flaxseed um, in, these, in these rodents. So exciting work going on um, in this area, but we don't have, even though radiation poses a very large risk for behavior, uh, behavioral health and performance, most of that is done through the, the radiation element. We just have this one study that's sort of in our portfolio. Um, we're also looking at how to um, estimate um, volume size, and this is really work that's being led by space human factors and habitability, um, but in working with them, trying to determine how do you take in the psychological aspect of, um, of habitat uh, size, the volume size because we can only send a, a vehicle that is so big on a mission to Mars. So what is the recommendation from a behavioral health and performance perspective for enough crew space? Well, there's not a lot of research looking at uh, people living in isolation and confinement um, over long durations of time in varying um, capsule sizes. So uh, we've um, recently um, convened a panel of subject matter experts from varying backgrounds um, to come and work with uh, subject matter experts at JSC to derive a, uh, a volume number that can be, uh, that we can at least start with, a volume number that we can now go off and research and try to validate against. And this um, panel uh, earlier uh, this year, taking into account um, things like historical numbers um, and also taking into account the process that's been laid out by Human Factors team led by um, Shay Thaxton, uh, Maribon Whitmore, and Carrie McGuire. They've looked at, okay, given the tasks that have to be done by the crews and the amount of volume that's required for each task, how do we take that into account in determining the minimum amount of volume? How do we optimize the size? So it was sort of a conglomerate of the two um, processes, more of a historical approach, sort of married with the task um, based approach, and we uh, provided a uh, proposed a net habitable volume number of 25 cubic meters per person, um, emphasizing though that we want to increase the crew quarters size um, because the crew quarters now on ISS is 2.1, I believe, per crew member. And what we do hear from talking with crews is that's an adequate size. 2.1 is adequate, but that's really relative to 
the remainder of a vehicle that's very large and a six month duration mission. It's, it's uh, probably a different beast when you're talking about your crew quarter size relative to a two and a half year mission um, and relative to a very small vehicle. So our recommendation was for the 25 cubic meters per person, but also maintaining a, a larger volume for each of those uh, crew quarters. And there's a, a report coming on, out on that um, hopefully soon that brings together that, that number. And we have other environmental kind of work that we're doing, trying to understand uh, how people um, uh, thrive in these analog environments and in space and in working with human factors and you know, what are their environmental countermeasures from a BHP point of view. Um, realizing how wordy these slides are, I'm so sorry. Um, another area that we're looking at, like I mentioned before, was uh, selection. And Dr. Larry Polinkas has a report out there talking about um, the characteristics that they've seen in Antarctica of folks who come in and um, thrive in these missions to Antarctica. And he's identified out of those characteristics which ones are the ones that you'd want to select for versus those that may be more malleable through training. And so this informs us what are those uh, competencies or characteristics that are more critical at the beginning and then things that are more teachable along the way. And so that's helping us to inform putting together um, selection and composition recommendations. We also have work going on in the area of monitoring. You may have heard of the WINSCAT. That's a cognitive measures that crews take now um, and uh, in uh, trying to assess their neurobehavioral functions. Um, we have a, a new measure that's uh, being evaluated that uh, is a little bit more comprehensive. Um, hopefully we'll get to the point where it uh, takes uh, less time, but it's sort of one of these smart tools. Um, I think luminosity or um, one of these tools that we see advertised, it's, it's similar in that this kind of hones in on where you might be needing more, um, more assessment. Um, and it's the cognition tool done through Dr. Matthias Basner um, out at uh, UPenn. We also have objective measures looking at minute changes in the face. This is something being tested in our, uh, in the HERA analog. Um, and another important thing that we're focusing on is trying to look at all these outcomes and risk factors in context of one another. So I mentioned the sleep study at the beginning of the presentation found that the average nightly sleep duration on ISS was right around six hours. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of those questions um, that we get following that study is, okay, to what extent was that due to um, the Soyuz dockings, the shuttle dockings, because the ISS data was collected when shuttle was, st was still going. So how much of that is you know, weighed down by some of these crazy slam shifting times that the crews had to do much more frequently a couple, three, four years ago than they do now? And so we really recognize that it's important to pull together context around the outcomes that we're looking at. And so this effort that we call the dashboard helps us, um, hopefully it's an effort to sort of pull together varying pieces so we can see sleep relative to stress levels, relative to maybe the mission timeline and helps us understand more fully what's going on. Um, we have resiliency training and stress training, things that are sort of uh, smart tools that are um, developed specifically for, uh, uh, for crews, um, but there's more and more of that coming out in, um, uh, you know, for just uh, non-crews, I guess, uh, terrestrial deliverables that universities are putting out and companies are putting out, stress management kinds of training online. Um, one area that's very exciting that we're uh, starting some efforts in is the aspect of virtual worlds. So um, when crews go on the way to Mars, um, can we have avatars that support them? Can we have um, organic LED, thin LED screens around that can help them um, kind of transport to uh, another, another space or co co uh, connect with their families that way, excuse me. So one of our researchers uh, through an SBR effort is working on that right now. Um, in our team risk, uh, we have research that's going on that's trying to understand how teams uh, evolve over time, and some of that's being done in the HERA analog here, um, as well as the, the uh, Mars uh, analog and other analogs. Um, and they're trying to understand these team dynamics in long duration, isolation, and confinement. Um, we just completed, and I'm uh, the HERA uh, for, for uh, one week, I say we completed, we were collecting data um, in these HERA missions, the four one week missions that happened this past fiscal year. Um, and so that's hopefully going to help address some of the, the missing pieces in our team risk, some of those temporal dynamics. 
um, and countermeasure effectiveness. Um, Dr. Brandon Vesey and our team, he's actually working very closely with uh, folks in NASA operations to conduct a job analysis to look at um, what are the competencies needed for um, a Mars astronaut. So the years ago, the competencies were defined for shuttle astronauts and ISS astronauts, but the Mars missions, um, as we know, are going to be so different. So what's, is it the same kind of crew member that we've been selecting for shuttle and ISS? Um, what are those characteristics that we really need to look at? And so Brandon's just done a phenomenal job looking at uh, working with ops to kind of define um, the job analysis, uh, the job of a Mars astronaut, and what are the criteria that would be, uh, what are the, the competencies for that astronaut. Um, it's been a three-phase process. They've done SME panels, individual interviews with crew members, um, and I've also um, implemented surveys. I believe they're analyzing data right now, and they're hoping that this will inform the astronaut selection process um, down the road, um, whether that's for researchers who are trying to conduct these long duration studies and have crews that are um, analogous to what a Mars crew would look like, and then maybe also for the Mars selection process. You know, this will be provided as hopefully input into that. Um, they've also done some fantastic work with uh, Mission Operations Director at NCB um, in the area of space flight uh, resource management. Um, one of the focuses of this effort, sorry, those two, those two slides were tied together, but um, one of the areas uh, a lot when you have teams working on critical tasks is how do you debrief after an incident? So how uh, the tendency actually and um, from what I've learned from uh, working with Brandon is for debriefs to happen sort of sequentially so first this happened then this happened or to happen or to focus on what went wrong and maybe not talk about you know what went well and so um, Brandon and other folks at VHP in working with uh, researchers uh, Dr. Eduardo, Eduardo Salas um, and Kim Yench at University of Central Florida. They've identified a process that the military has been using um, for conducting structured debriefs. And they were able to go in and work with Mission Operations Directorate to do these debriefs in a more structured way. And what they found was that um, after doing their, their study, um, that it, the, the structured debriefs were effective in increasing um, the flight controller's team uh, technical learning and that the time for them to get certified was reduced by 50%, which was a, you know, a huge finding um, and time savings for them. So they're currently working with MOD to try to put together uh, a debrief program that's more specific to them, but kind of rolling in uh, what's come out of the science here to help inform, again, how uh, crews are supported now, even ground crews. And this will hopefully also inform um, our exploration uh, mission operations directorate as well. And they're also continuing to look at uh, teams over long duration. We talked about the HERA studies. Um, we are working with a team at University of Hawaii um, where they have an analog there. It's not a NASA analog. This is done through um, University of Hawaii, but they're evaluating a cruise in context of four months, six months, and eight months in isolation and confinement. And then in our last area, in our sleep area, and this is the um, area I'm most familiar with, but uh, we're trying to provide tools, uh, develop and provide tools to crew members um, that will help them have an objective, objective assessment of their sleep. And so in the past few years, we've seen much more on the market that's out there, smart watches and uh, measures that are out there that tell you how much you slept, how many steps you've taken. Um, and uh, this is something that's, that's very useful. Um, the actigraphies that were actually used, the actor watches that were actually used um, in flight that study started in 2000, maybe even 1999, the one that we were looking at the data and it concluded data collection in 2011. There was a big gap in um, following Columbia and so that's why you know, it took so long. But uh, those actor watches were about, I think around $2,000 each. <laughs> so now it's nice to go to the store and you, know, you see these things at Target, at Walmart, these um, watches that measure our sleep, you know, Apple's coming out with one, um, but uh, Unfortunately, even though these are very appealing because they're commercial and they're off the shelf, they're still not everything that was sort of is required for space flight. Um, the, the preciseness might not be there, the battery life's not there, so we have an effort now to try to take something that's already existing off the shelf. Uh, we don't want to reinvent the wheel, but to, to 
um, get it to where it's ready um, for space flight um, because there's even though there's a lot out there it seems to be missing um, each each piece is not quite there yet and then um, this has been a big effort um, uh, from uh, not just our team but uh, particularly folks in human factors um, Tony Clark who's here who's just been phenomenal in um, um, helping with lighting on ISS or um, uh, spearheading what the lighting requirements should look like on ISS. We're working this with the, the vehicle board. Um, essentially what came about was in 2000, maybe as far back as 2010, I'm trying to remember, the ISS program was looking to replace all their lights that are up there right now. And the lights that are up on ISS still to this day, they're fluorescent based um, and they're burning out, they're very dim. And we had a lot of research going on in our area that was looking at um, the neurobehavioral effects of light. So light ha plays a, a very large part on our physiology. We're just not as aware of it. Um, but we uh, knew from the research that uh, NASA was funding and research funded also by the National Space Biomedical Research Institute and, and others, uh, other universities that uh, light that is actually uh, very bright um, it not only you know wakes you up. I mean, intuitively we know bright light's gonna uh, wake us up, but it'll suppress your melatonin at night and and keep you from sleeping. And if you enrich the light in the blue end of the spectrum, um, you can actually minimize the brightness and get a very strong response where you're suppressing melatonin. Um, fluorescent lights are completely depleted of uh, very depleted of of blue light. So it's just a very um, yellowish light and so what uh, for crew members who are day and night under the fluorescent light they're not getting like a morning cue you know we drive to work we get a, a burst of blue light in the morning and that cues our physiology that it's morning and then in the evenings the sky is you know much less blue we hit that um, sort of warmer night sky um, and uh, we start getting into darkness and you know that cues our body that's time to sleep um, crew members have, they don't have that morning cue, and um, we saw evidence previously, I showed you about the, the sleep difficulties, the circadian misalignment that happens, and it could be that light is playing a big part in this. So we brought this evidence forward in an effort to request a um, flexible lighting system on the ISS. And um, as a result of many, many people's efforts, um, the ISS program chose to provide um, a, uh, they were going forward with an LED-based system, but now it's an LED-based system which will provide a morning setting or a, a, a setting that's very bright if they need to stay awake at night and conduct critical operations or shift their circadian rhythms, an evening setting, and then a general daytime setting. So they'll be able to toggle, in addition to off, between three different light settings. And um, if what we've seen on the, um, from the terrestrial research uh, translates into space light, we should hopefully see a better um, circadian uh, response to that than what they're having now, um, hopefully improve sleep. Now, walking this path of trying to translate scientific research into a practical uh, light for the station, um, you know, thought when we went and did our presentation in 2010, one of many, but the final one where they signed off on the dotted line, that great, all right, we'll see you, you know, lights on ISS in a few years. Um, as Tony probably more than anyone can attest to, it's been a very long journey because uh, the implications of replacing um, what's been on station, uh, these fluorescent lights with now bright LEDs, it affects photo video. We ended up with a prototype about a year and a half ago that um, had a greenish tint, which meant NASA TV was going to be a greenish, greenish look to it. Um, and so that took some heavy lifting to try to change that. Then there's changes in the frequencies um, in an LED light versus fluorescent. And so it's a constant having to revisit the actual implementation, um, how are we going to implement this lighting system? And um, sadly what happens is, you know, you kind of have to, you know, I'm, I'm there to represent the circadian uh, neurobehavioral side. Um, we have other folks that are there to represent photo video. We have space medicine. Everybody's there trying to represent their interest and what they want to see this light lead to. And you all kind of have to give up a little bit <laughs> because if we had it our way, the green light would have been fine because from a circadian perspective, it worked, worked well. But we know that's not acceptable from you know, a crew, crew acceptance and a photo video perspective. So we really have had to walk this journey 
um, on operational implementation of the science. Um, and it's still going, we're still not quite there yet, but hopefully getting there. And a little hair up there in the hopes that uh, even though we're having the new uh, lighting system on ISS, we plan on evaluating, doing some research to uh, make sure it's as effective as we um, had hoped, and then to continue looking at optimizing those protocols um, even more in platforms um, such as HERA. And um, in addition to the lighting, we also have uh, scheduling tools that can take into account your sleep-wake history and then provide a performance prediction to let you know or to let a crew member know if you're planning this critical op tomorrow at 5, based on your sleep-wake history, you're going to be at a point in your circadian phase where you might be more at risk. So we're really trying to provide tools that in a more autonomous exploration scenario, a crew member can be equipped to make these kinds of decisions about the tasks that they're going to take on. I think this is the last slide. Um, in addition, our countermeasures include um, medications. Uh, we're looking at medications. We're also seeing if uh, diet plays a role in helping regulate our circadian rhythms, what we eat and the timing of uh, when we eat, uh, if that is related to sleep. Um, there's some new research that shows when we're sleep deprived, uh, we tend to crave um, um, more food, particularly carbs. Shocker to, <laughs> I crave chocolate, um, so yes. Uh, but there's more and more of that research showing a very close tie between sleep and uh, uh, timing of food and the content of food, as well as our circadian rhythms and timing of food. So these are the kinds of things we're looking at in the hopes that we can uh, fully equip our, our future crews. Sorry, last thing I think. Um, the, we do have some ISS one-year research studies. A lot of what I've shown you is going to continue on. The journal study is actually still continuing the sleep-wake study. The cognitive measure um, is also going forward, and we have um, some work that we're doing led by uh, human factors on uh, training and habitability that we're involved in. So um, our next slides uh, just have to do with um, our critical path, which I won't say anything about because I think seeing who's in the room you all have had enough of these. <laughs> um, but each of our risk areas, as you know, has a critical path that's helping us understand where we're going and what we need to provide at that time. So um, that was it. I'm sorry for talking so much. Um, but are there any questions? I don't know if that was any new information. A lot of familiar folks in the room. Yes. So are submarine missions not a good analogy? Are they not down under the water for long months at a time? It's a great question. I think we want to, we're, we're starting to work actually with the Office of Naval Research to hopefully partner with uh, some of the work that's going on in submarines. But just like the other analogs, um, it's, it's limited in that they tend to have uh, large populations. I think they tend to have over at least 100 people in the, sub, in the subs usually. And their missions are about three to six months is my understanding. So it's definitely informative, but it's, uh, I don't think any of our analogs are really that perfect analog to uh, Mars. So I think it's, it's definitely something that's going to help us um, in the long run, but we have to consider it in light of the limitations. Yeah. Great question. So for the um, one year mission or the long duration mission where you're seeing that their sleep is going down and down and down, uh, does their does, um, their potentially get sick um, increase? You know? That's a great question. Yeah. And so we're hoping to, um, thankfully, the coordination for the ISS one year is happening at the HRP level where the different disciplines will get to um, share data. So we're very optimistic that we'll be able to look at the sleep data relative to what the immune team is collecting because that that is definitely a question and um, I'm not nearly as familiar with their work as I should be but I do remember Brian Crucian presenting some data a while ago that showed a dipped immune response just before launch actually I'm thinking shuttle astronauts and we had the same not surprisingly in their sleep dipping right before launch because of course they're about to launch and so it would suggest that there might be a tie and there's terrestrial literature that shows definitely that um, immune susceptibility increases when we are sleep deprived so yeah that's a concern that we want to take a look at great question do you consider habitable volume or do you make habitable volume recommendations for shorter missions or I noticed the only yeah. mission you had was 900 days but what about four people in Orion for 30 days or 20 days or all the other DRMs. Is that in your purview or only really long duration? 
That's a good question. I know from our perspective, what we've been pulled on has more to do with the long duration because I think that's sort of unprecedented. Um, but I do hear about you know, the, or I know how accurate this is, but that there's discussions around the Orion capsule um, supporting missions of 30 days or more, and that's a concern. That seems like that would be, you know, from a psychological perspective, very difficult to do. Five days, sure, you know, but 30 days seems. But formally, no, we haven't gotten involved in that yet. But that the volume research is really led by human factors folks. So I'll defer to Carrie to see if she's got a response about the short duration one. Well, no, we've just been pushed to study for a long duration because okay. Because even the short, even like the, sorry, but the, the size of the Orion capsule, and I know we've had missions, Apollo and so forth, but it seems like when you're going 30 days or more that there is a lack there in, in spaces that small. So it's, I don't know, maybe it's an area that might get pulled on a little bit, the, the human factors group and, and our group on that. But for right now, no, I mean, that's been the same for us. We're, because of the lack of literature around the long duration, that's really where they've focused our efforts. Well, on the same note, for the sense of volume and their, the psychological sense of volume, did they look at lighting um, and how, how the amount of light in that space could change their view of how big that space mm -hmm. might look? That's a great question. They, the, the report, um, and if you're interested, I'm happy to send it to you all, but it's, where we recommend the 25 cubic meters uh, per person. It comes with like 10 pages of caveats. <laughs> Maybe not 10 pages, but there's a lot of caveats in there. 25 cubic meters per person, given that, and uh, you know, one of the things we emphasize is that they optimize the lighting. So it's 25 cubic meters, and you know, we recommend um, optimizing the lighting. But did we mathematically take that into account? We did not. Um, yes? So the 25 cubic meters is net? Yes. So total volume would then include the uh, subsystems and so on and so on. Correct. Okay. And storage. Yes. Yes. That's your 10 pages of. That's the 10 pages, yeah. <laughs> I'll send it to you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> it's got, and we even had schematics. We worked, one of the panel members was um, Dr. Hugh Broughton. You know Hugh, right? So um, he uh, is an architect that has done phenomenal work um, in the UK and won a uh, contract several years ago by the British government to set up the um, new British station in Antarctica. And uh, when they put in their proposal, they had folded in all sorts of psychological countermeasures that he talked about, like using um, certain cedars uh, as the wood in some of the areas to enhance the smells in the station. And, um, they had a greenhouse, so they really folded in a lot of those countermeasures, and so we invited him to participate on this panel. He also talked about in this presentation, in case anyone saw him, one of the things they proposed was a bar with a rock climbing wall. <laughs> and so even though they got awarded, they were told, you need to pull one of those. It's not going to work to have a you know, rock climbing wall with the bar. So I think they actually ended up going with the bar, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but uh, like, <laughs> follow up, what about the use of color? I didn't hear you talk about that much, and I know yeah. ISS is kind of more like a laboratory than really a living space because the use of color yes. is kind of voided. Yeah, so I could speak to you a little bit about this, the more of the circadian sides of color. Like we mentioned, the blue having an alerting effect. Our brains will um, respond to blue um, by suppressing melatonin. Um, we don't really, green sort of green in smaller doses seems to show the same kind of response. Um, we haven't really looked at other aspects of psychology and colors. Yeah, it, there it, might it be some, uh, risk, yeah. Really. And I would think it would be because as architects, we've used color and lighting um, throughout history to enhance the uh, experience for humans in, in the various things we develop. Yeah, no, it's, it's uh, I think it's important. We're, the work that we're doing in environmental countermeasures is very new. We just had a uh, um, researcher, Dr. Ann Kearney, she completed a review for us about a year ago. And so we're gonna start hopefully implementing some studies 
And um, so we haven't gotten down to the specifics of what we need to do related to the environment, but that's definitely something that is a consideration. In addition to, yeah, the volume size and the layout, <coughs> there's going to be things like color, um, privacy, other things that we need to take a look at. But you're absolutely right. That's a good question. Yeah. It, and I, I seem to recall somebody in the human factors group a few years ago bringing that up, so I don't know if anyone in that division has done anything. Okay. Well, the only problem with color is that if you made a lighting countermeasure, then you have a specific spectrum. So if you have a predominant color in that space, you can um, mess up your lighting spectrum. Yeah. So you gotta get a trail. Sure. Yeah, and even those virtual worlds we were talking about having, you know, thin LED screens, but you have to consider, okay, how are we gonna reconcile the blue light that comes from LEDs at night, you know, there's, so some of your countermeasures might introduce new risks, and so it's that reconciling that uh, when you get to the implementation piece, um, you really have to start weighing how, you, how you're going to make these things that scientifically show mm -hmm. an improvement. How do you integrate that with everything else without causing too much disruption? And yeah, the color would definitely be one of those things. Great. Yep. Is there any thoughts or investigations in the fact that you're going to have two crew members going for a year and they're going to be visiting with four people that come up and go down and then other four come up and go down and affects the dynamics, you know, one crew's AC and then we're, we're still up here for another six months and yeah. how that affects your perception. Well, I can do this for another two weeks because I'm going home and they're staying for another six months. Yeah, that is a I great question. Right, yeah, no, that's a great question. And um, so I mentioned Brandon Vesey, he's our uh, team risk lead scientist, and he actually um, was advocating for a flight study um, that he's kind of short titled team task switching. So it's, it's focused just on that. Um, um, and I think he's hoping to get it into a flight study eventually, or hoping to be able to solicit for that. I'm not sure of the status on it, but it's definitely something that has been raised as a concern. I mean, you're absolutely right. There's implications and things that could happen, and I think at, at the level you're talking about is uh, kind of over maybe the morale, and he's definitely interested in that, but also um, from one task to another. Um, I think anecdotally they've heard crews talk about it can be difficult sometimes when you're working on something on your own, and then you move to another task, it suddenly becomes more of a task where you're, inter you're depending on your fellow crew members, and um, some of that change too is, uh, can, can be difficult to, to, to wrestle. So that's something that he's hoping to evaluate on both, both levels. Good question. And maybe another one too is for these long-term Mars missions. Are there any thoughts about you know, we are simulating events to make the, their mission dynamic so it's not a steady state of nothing going on? Like that study was showing how they get lethargic in time. Yeah. So useful things like, oh, something's going on or something's. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because they actually implemented a Mars mission scenario in that study. So they had them, um, they really tried to introduce the high fidelity day. So they had a wake up call, um, the crew would get up, they had tasks that they had to work on and apparently they took it very seriously. And then about, um, I, can't, I think a year in, they have then a Mars landing, they simulate a Mars landing and two, so two of the crew members got to go walk on a, a Mars surface. So there's pictures of them, you know, wearing like a spacesuit and going out and doing some um, studies and coming back in, and then they simulated the journey home. So I think they tried to roll that in as much as they could. Um, I think some of the tr difficulty with that kind of an analog is the psychological fidelity can be, you know, despite their their I think amazing attempts to do that, it's still you're still not really, you know, on a mission. I, I don't know how the crew kind of reconcile that, but I, th I think they really did make an effort to try to um, get it as much to an ISS day as they could. I just don't think it was quite there. Um, but it, it's an important part. The workload that these um, participants do in analogs are really important um, to the fidelity of, of the mission and, um, you know, that their, to their experience too, because um, you don't want them going in there and feeling like um, they're not, their time isn't valuable. Um, and then also for us to have data that means something. So it's a great, great suggestion. All right. Thank 
y'all. I appreciate your time very, very much. Is there anything? I don't want to put you on the spot, Allie. Perfect. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to the today. We passed the Wilson survey, but you had to come to Peace Computer Survey. We can pass them to Ruby before you leave. We also have the Thank you.